It recently dawned on me that there's still two games published by Game Mill Entertainment that I've yet to get the Platinums for. These two games have been received about as well as you'd expect, coming off their recent success that probably sold about five copies. One of them, of course, being to me. Now, being the avid Game Mill fan that I am, I knew what had to be done. So I went ahead and grabbed these two incredible games physically because I love physical games and then continued the journey that I would like to call the Game Mill Trilogy. Also, this video is sponsored by War Thunder, but there'll be more on that in a little bit. Now, if you're familiar with the channel, I usually showcase some kind of intro cutscene here, and, well, the game doesn't even have one. Instead, we are chucked right into the action by pushing this hospital bed out of the way, and then walking down this hall before being told, I need to find some meds. I originally thought this game didn't look too bad, but after witnessing the first cutscene, my opinion quickly shifted. Why is that, bro? Fucking oh, hell. These PNG cutscenes are used constantly throughout the game, and some were a lot funnier than others. That's it. <laughs> we either take care of this right now. We take care of this right now. Go. We just gotta go. Now hold, hold on, on Jane. <laughs> you can't tell me you're okay with this. <laughs> For now though, we are tasked with sneaking through the hospital car park to earn the first trophy of the game. There's a quick slideshow that explains that Rick was shot just before the outbreak, resulting in him missing the entire thing and waking up from his coma just after the entire world went downhill. We are helped by some random man that I'm actually more than sure has a name in the actual show, but as per usual with these kind of games, the developers are under the assumption that you're only buying this game if you're an avid fan of the show. So I literally have no clue who this guy is. There's a section in the first episode that teaches us the basics of combat. And after grabbing this knife to stab a walker in the head, we can earn the trophy, kill the brain. We eventually stumble across a police vehicle and in order to see if it's even operational, we need to eliminate all the walkers in the way. I'm just going to state the obvious here, but the combat system in this game is genuinely terrible. If you're in a big group like this one, getting grabbed once usually results in every single walker trying to get a piece of the action. And with each walker that grabs you, you're forced to spam a certain button for a longer period of time. To make this worse, successfully escaping this attack usually ends up in another one because the walkers are able to grab you without a cooldown. There's also a few other moves like stomping the crawling enemies and also a special attack that works once your adrenaline is full, but for the most part, the combat really isn't that enjoyable. Like you can handle your own. Now get to that cruiser. Hello? I read you, where are you? You're breaking up. Please respond. After a truly gripping cutscene, we are told that the guy's name from earlier is Morgan and that we have split ways in order to search for Rick's family. We arrive at Atlanta to see the city completely overrun by walkers and get to experience the rayfall mechanic for the first time. This is pretty much a last stand kind of situation in that if you're about to die while being grabbed, the game pushes the walkers away to give you another shot at staying alive. After staying alive long enough to regain some health and leave rayfall mode, we can earn another trophy. Ooh, feeling a little better now. Sometimes surviving the rayful mode isn't as easy, and I would soon earn a trophy for dying for the first time. Get out of here! I was stuck in this exact location for a while because the game has the exact same issue that Kong did, where it will give you an objective and then proceed to give you no sense of direction or any help in regards to actually reaching that objective. Due to this, I died multiple times and eventually entered a state of panic, both in real life and in the game, before surviving yet again to earn another trophy. Ooh, feeling a little better now. As it stands right now, you might be thinking to yourself, Satire, this game doesn't really look that bad, all things considered. And to be honest, there was a small period of time where I was willing to agree. Until I reached this section where you were introduced to Glenn, and after sneaking through a few enemies, we are able to grab all the skill points in this section for a trophy. Or at least that was the intention. What actually happened was the game decided it was better to only reward me with skill points for two of the items rather than three, making this trophy technically unobtainable. Why is that not the trophy, what the fuck? Was telling me that you get 13 from this one point, but I'm only getting 12. 
I tried restarting the checkpoint, restarting the entire episode, and even closing the game to see if anything would work. But still, the game wouldn't reward me with enough skill points. After looking around at other playthroughs and reading up online, it really started to look like I was the only person in the entire world that had experienced this issue, and I was genuinely concerned that the platinum run was well and truly over. Oh, fuck's sake. As a last ditch attempt, I went ahead and deleted my entire save file to see if anything would change this time around. All right, we're back where we were meant to be. So, let's see. Yes. Fucking hell. With the platinum back on track, I progressed on until reaching this section with Rick with a conveniently placed grenade amongst a large group of enemies, leading me to blow up five of them for a lovely trophy. And you're wasting bullets we ain't even got. And you'll bring walkers down on our ass, man. Just chill. You think I'm going to start taking orders from you? <laughs> I don't think so, bro. <laughs> I pull this trigger. It'll be the best use of ammo all day. Come on. After that absolutely intense fight, we are given our first choice of the game. Now, because I haven't really delved into The Walking Dead before, I kind of had no clue as to who was who. But after doing the game's job for them and searching up which of the two characters was called Merle, I chose to handcuff him for the first of many effortless trophy names. Yeah. Hey! Stop! If I get loose, you better pray! You hear me, you pig? You hear me? Episode 4 finally brought some lore into this game as I started to truly understand where the story was going. Essentially, while Rick was in a coma, his best friend decided to get with his wife and start looking at the rich kid as a father figure. I was pretty curious as to how long it took for these two to start making a move on each other and according to this Reddit post from 13 years ago, most people are under the impression that they got together within a single month of the apocalypse starting. Ignoring all of this for now though, the episode starts with Laurie telling Shane You don't stay out too long before walking off in this direction which is super important because we are also required to head in the same direction too before meeting an entire horde of zombies. So I guess Laurie somehow made it through unharmed with no weapons to protect herself. There's two pretty simple trophies to be earned here and they're both earned for doing the exact same thing. So after stabbing 10 walkers in a row, I got both of the trophies. After earning these two trophies, I went to make some food and pause my game while I was gone. You know, pretty normal stuff. But when I came back to the game, everything stopped making a sound, except for the noise when collecting a skill point. I, I genuinely don't know how this would even become a situation in the first place, but it did make for a very interesting cutscene after I finished the mission. Wait, what's that noise? That sounds exactly like the sponsor of today's video, War Thunder. War Thunder is the most comprehensive vehicle combat game ever made, with over 70 million players and over 2,500 planes, tanks, ships, and helicopters, ranging from the 1920s to present day, to help you win those epic PvP fights. And I mean, you seriously have so many vehicles to choose from, whether it's the armored cars from almost 100 years ago, or the fighter jets you use today that are showcased in extreme detail. My favorite feature of War Thunder has to be this very impressive x-ray view. If your vehicle is damaged by an enemy, War Thunder will show you exactly where you were hit in extreme detail, letting you know which part of your vehicle was damaged and what ultimately led to the destruction of the vehicle. Not only that, but War Thunder is also heavily optimized, running on an in-house developed engine, allowing anyone to receive high frames and impressive graphics, even on lower end machines. And the best part of this entire thing is that War Thunder is completely free on PC, PlayStation and Xbox. Whether you're a new player or you haven't played in over six months, you can click my link in the description to get a massive bonus pack that includes 100,000 silver lions, multiple premium vehicles, seven days of premium, and a whole lot more. Also, to celebrate the new year in style, you will receive these festive decals to decorate your vehicles with. These are only available until the end of January, so be sure to grab them while you can. Thank you to War Thunder for sponsoring this video, and let's get back to The Walking Dead. 
Now that we have been welcomed into the group, we are introduced to the conflict feature, where you are met with an argument between two survivors and are required to choose who you think is right. But while a concept is kind of cool, the overall choice you make has zero impact on any future situations, and the only thing you receive for doing these are a few skill points. I would honestly prefer not to do these, but the game requires you to resolve the conflict before doing the next mission, meaning I had to do these pretty much every single time. The other semi-pointless thing in this game are expeditions. These are, I guess, the closest thing to a side mission within this game and they pop up randomly throughout these missions. You get a choice between a good or bad answer with 90% of them making no sense as to which one is actually the good or bad option. And then about five seconds later, you'll get told as to whether the option you picked failed the expedition or passed the expedition, both of which earns a trophy. Okay, this should be a trophy, I believe. There we go. And then quickly restart the checkpoint because I hope it didn't save and then we can redo that again. Nice. That's there we go. Two easy trophies back to back. Rick, over here! As that truly informative five second cutscene told you, the camp has been overrun with walkers and somehow everyone else has managed to escape minus Rick's wife and son. While trying to save both of them as quickly as possible, I figured out that the developers forgot to set a button cooldown when trying to pick up an object. Oh, what is that? You <laughs> just... <laughs> I ended up unlocking five trophies in this single section and it really got me thinking about the fact I'm pretty much just playing for an overpriced shovelware game. I got a trophy for eliminating a walker with no stamina left. Oh, lovely stuff. They'd be giving trophies out, I swear. One for getting six kills without reloading. Another one for accidentally getting a double headshot with one bullet. my father. Oh, I got a two for one as well. And finally, keeping the trailer's health above 30%, which not only was extremely easy, but also earned the trophy safety first, and then welcome to the apocalypse for beating act one. There you go, safety first, okay, nice. There we go, welcome to the apocalypse. As you may have noticed, there's been a lot of talk about the skill points within this game. The trophy bugged out, the sound bugged out, the expeditions and conflict only give skill points. So you may be wondering, how useful are these skill points? And uh, I honestly couldn't tell you. The skills do have actual descriptions, like increasing your revolver damage by 50%, but I honestly can't confirm whether these actually worked or not, because I didn't really notice any change in gameplay. The only real benefit I found to upgrading my skills is that a trophy unlocked after upgrading the 10th one. Great. Rick, walkers, a mess of them headed this way. Oh, Christ. Sophia! Stay here. I got her. Now that Sophia had run away, we are tasked with getting her back in one piece. And this is when the game started to feel, honestly, pretty repetitive. The combat is the exact same, the missions are just so boring with no story at all, and the best thing about this episode was that I unlocked a trophy for chopping up 10 walkers with an axe. Can't get too close when that thing's about to blow. As you also just saw, we are introduced to the grenade walkers. These are walkers with explosive jackets that just kind of walk around freely until you get close enough for them to explode. And it did make me wonder just how Sophia managed to get through this group without being blown to pieces. After taking them all out though, we do eventually find her and force her to hide under this tree while we clear the rest of them out. That herd came out of nowhere. So this situation comes up a lot throughout this game where you're meant to fight off all the incoming walkers. I actually do like this as it changes up the gameplay from the norm, but I quickly discovered that the time limit is just to survive and you can very easily run around for a minute with the same group of walkers until the time is up. Also, at this very moment in the game, my capture card started destroying itself and frames started freezing out of nowhere. This has genuinely never happened before and I can't really tell if the walking dead just fried my Elgato or if it was dying either way. But if you notice any frame jumps from this point on, I think it's fair to assume that Game Mill are the ones responsible. Sophia decides that the best way out of this situation is to just do a runner and leave us to take out the entire group of walkers for literally no reason. This would end up being the least of our worries though, as somehow both Shane and Carl appear out of nowhere to try and save the day. And while Shane and Rick are arguing, Carl wanders off towards his deer in hopes he can make a better father figure in his life. That's you. You doubt me? Carl! Oh no, 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 no! 
Now, at this point, I was pretty lost in the story because we instantly arrive at this farm run by a guy called Herschel, who welcomes us in with open arms way too quickly. I assume in the show, there's some kind of build up to the situation or someone tips us off as to where this farm is located. But in the game, we just kind of arrive at this farm and next minute, the farm is now the HQ for the entire group. Now, I do like this HQ feature and I wish the game adapted into it more. Certain things like having an armory or being able to speak to certain characters with different dialogue options. I mean, just anything really other than just a single conflict per mission that doesn't really make a single difference to the overall story. Due to Carl being on his deathbed, we arrive at a local school to try and find some medical supplies for Herschel to operate on. And this single mission has a whopping eight trophies tied to it. I earned the trophy Machete Kills for, if you can believe it, getting 10 Machete Kills snuck around the back of the medical trailer, grabbed the shotgun and shot four walkers without reloading, picked up the pistol I had just dropped to shoot three walkers in the head, and then picked up this random crowbar lying around to take down 15 walkers fairly easily. With the first four trophies out of the way, I grabbed the medical supplies from this trailer to finally wrap up the mission. Well, that's what I assumed now that we had the medical supplies, but instead we are chucked right back into the same location as Shane. I believe this is also the exact same time of day, but uh, Maggie is nowhere to be seen. As Shane, I grab the shotgun once again before heading into this school to once again grab some medical supplies. This was honestly super easy, and once all five pieces had been collected, I headed into the school's gym to shoot this walker while it was screaming at all of you to subscribe. Another very pointless survival section happened here, so after running around for a whole minute, we take control of Maggie to protect Shane from harm. And would you believe me if I said there was another trophy to be earned here? All they had to do was eliminate 15 walkers, which I would have done either way, so the trophy was extremely easy. For the next trophy, I had to eliminate this massive walker using melee attacks only, and I really didn't know if I could do this. I mean, the boss is massive, strong, and would grab me as soon as I got close. The melee attacks were doing nothing, and Maggie wasn't even shooting any bullets because I guess the developers didn't program that to happen. I was pretty sure this was going to take a while before the boss just fell to the ground after about five hits. Get out of here. Because act two was finally coming to a close, another choice presented itself. Save Maggie from getting eaten alive or save Carl from bleeding out back at the farm. God forgive me. Shane, no! As unbelievable as this might sound, I do kind of like the telltale style of choices here. I had a look at another playthrough and Carl does indeed die if you choose Maggie, leading to the entire group carrying on without him. To have a pretty significant character die off so early and still let the game play out is actually a pretty cool feature. But of course, Carl was alive in my playthrough, so we continued on as the game let us know that Maggie had indeed left the group. We get told that Laurie is pregnant in this five second paragraph that I skipped, and then this incredible cutscene plays with absolutely no voiceover whatsoever. <laughs> The next mission takes us back to when Shane went to see if Rick was actually dead. We travel through the hospital, taking out five enemies for a trophy. And then visit Rick to witness this truly emotional cutscene, letting us know that Rick did indeed look dead. Shane barricades the door, I guess to make sure his best mate doesn't get eaten alive. And then this extremely random situation happens where actual human enemies just appeared out of nowhere, surviving up to five headshots before dying. Huh? <laughs> What's wrong? What's going on? <laughs> Hot. They could dodge my shots by moving super fast and even roll across the entire room, which left me speechless. <laughs> it's like a real life person. With everything I had just seen, there was no way I was sticking around to fight more of these enemies, so I just ran past them to finish the mission. Eventually, we are tasked with emptying this barn full of walkers, and doing this without getting hit earns us yet another trophy. Just a few more! After the barn is cleared, a pretty sad revelation happens as Sophia walks out the barn as a walker. No way. Bro's on business. <laughs> What the? Oh, first ever cinematic. I guess this was the final nail in the coffin for Shane and Rick's friendship. As the game chucks us straight into the biggest choice of the game, who do I want to lead the group, Shane or Rick? Okay.
With this choice out of the way, we are chucked into a 1v1 against Shane, which is probably one of the worst design fights I have ever played. Shane has literal aimbot, stun locking me with every shot, and he has that fast, inhumane roll that the soldiers had from the hospital. <laughs> This fight also has two waves and the second wave consists of melee only weapons with an entire group of walkers getting in the way and when you thought it couldn't get any worse the game kept showing me random quotes from different characters while I was literally trying to win the fight. I also had to redo this entire fight in under three minutes for another trophy which I luckily figured out by following this video posted by clickerlicker19. I genuinely wouldn't have been able to do this game without this guide as there's no chapter select and no guide anywhere else on the internet so this really Really was a lifesaver. Oh! First cuts into the game. I'm gonna be the first one they ever made. This was you, not me. Okay. <laughs> Yes. Okay. 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 I'm glad. I'm glad I realized I missed that one. Otherwise, yeah, that would have required an entirely new playthrough, which would have just been crazy. So act three is when we stumble across the prison and this is the place that we stay for the remainder of the game. It's actually quite a good spot, but we need to make sure the place is secure. And in doing so, eliminate 15 walkers with a sledgehammer. I was also making sure to eliminate enemies using the adrenaline attack as there is a trophy coming up for using this special attack on every weapon in the game. For now though, we can stumble across the choice of act three. Who the hell are you? Andrew, who the hell are you? You just come on out of there slow and steady. With the prison secure, we send the oldest member of our team down into the basement to see if there's an armory hidden underneath the prison. And this is when I found a pretty cool glitch that would make this level extremely easy. After finding an assault rifle within the basement, I press this button to open all the doors in the area. This, of course, let basically every walker out, but it also gave me access to this ammo crate, and what I quickly noticed was every time I approached this crate, I would be able to grab more ammo. I tested this for a while, and quickly racked up 10, 20, 30,000 bullets in my mag, until eventually reaching 100,000 bullets ready to fire onto the walkers. This made the next trophy extremely easy, as I had to eliminate 5 enemies in 10 seconds using the assault rifle. But what I also did was expose an extremely stupid mechanic in this game that I can only assume was not intended. See, a lot of walkers die relatively fast after a few bullets to the head. But from a lot of testing with the unlimited ammo I had in my gun, these walkers will not die with a bullet to the body. No matter how many bullets I shot, the walkers would stay alive unless I shot them in the head or hit them with a melee weapon. This basically meant that unless you have godlike aim on an extremely bad game, the best and pretty much only option moving forward was to just use melee weapons. With the prison now blasting an alarm, thanks to Andrew, Laurie miraculously goes into labor and we are tasked with taking down all the alarms around the prison. This was relatively easy and we eventually enter a chase sequence with Andrew, which leads to this boss fight. Just like the one between Rick and Shane, <laughs> this was not the greatest boss fight I have ever completed. The lighting here was horrible and the entire fight just felt like a very bad Dead by Daylight ripoff. The whole idea is to turn off these generators so the alarms turn off, but it's impossible to see which generators are the ones to turn off. We do eventually get into the final stage of the fight and the developers decided that the best way to show this is actually the final stage is to make it even harder to see what's going on. But like, what is this lighting, bro? Like, what the hell? Where is it? Bro, what is this fucking... What is this lighting, man? Oh, he's already dead. That's nice. Oh, no way. She dead. I'm sorry. I didn't know what to do. I, I couldn't. <laughs> <laughs> the little baby's there. Who, who, how's this kid like minus one years old and he's already got conflict? The next mission introduces us to Michonne as we are trying to find some baby formula with Daryl before he gets captured by the enemies. Michonne is the only character in the game wielding the katana, which marks the last weapon I needed to use the special attack on for the trophy Executioner. 
After eliminating all the enemies in the area, we can leave Daryl behind and take the baby formula back to the group. Guy with the crossbow. He told me which direction it was in. Said it was a straight shot. Where is he? Taken. By the same son of a bitch who's after me. There's a town. Woodbury. About 75 survivors. Your man was taken there. Act 4 starts in Woodbury, a fully operational town with the governor and Merle, the guy that we handcuffed at the start of the game. I don't really know exactly where this falls into the timeline, but we do know that it's a flashback relating to the people who took Daryl. The first order of business within this town is to completely forget about the tour we are receiving to find all the skill points in this beginning section. Just like the trophy with Glenn, it only has three or four pieces to collect around the map. Great. After I grabbed this trophy, I returned back to the very in-depth tour that told me everything I needed to know about Woodbury. The tour ends and we are shown to our room, which to be fair, is a pretty nice way to live considering we are technically a prisoner here. Michonne decides that this living accommodation isn't good enough and we head out to find our katana taken by the governor, starting one of the only true stealth sections in this game. And it probably doesn't surprise you that this was also a broken buggy mess. The game focuses heavily on using objects to distract the guards, which at first felt like a pretty nice feature to have, but it quickly occurred to me that this feature doesn't even work at all. This'll distract him. What? What? <laughs> what am I meant to do? What the hell? After crouching past more guards, we eventually make it to the ultimate decision of Act 4. To save the governor's child, who is quite clearly infected and a danger to the entire town, or let the child live. I mean, given the fact that I don't feel like the choices really have any consequences, um, I'm, I'm just going to spare the daughter. The, the governor hasn't really done anything bad mm -hmm. from what I can tell. I mean, in the actual like series, he might be like the worst person in the world, but the game isn't really portraying this to me. So I'm going to spare the zombie daughter, I think. Should be a trophy as well. Lovely stuff. What the hell? This is what I mean, man. Like your choices just don't have like, no! they, don't, they don't matter. Like the choices don't have any consequences. <laughs> With that truly epic fight between Michonne and Merle coming to an end, we escape Woodbury as the governor by running past every single enemy in the game since they really can't detect you at all, unlocking a trophy for not getting low on health during this final section. No fucking way. Okay, cool. <laughs> I was gonna say, if that ruined the trophy, that would've been crazy. Now you hold it right there, governor. It's over. We gonna have us some fun now. Even though the governor was captured, which by the way, was a flashback from at least a few weeks ago, we somehow get Philip, which I guess is his real name, added to our HQ. And what makes this more confusing is that he's nowhere to be seen because of course, he's still being held hostage in Woodbury. Now that Michonne had let us know where Daryl is located, we head to a local warehouse to check for ammo supplies. And this is where I unlock the trophy, Guns Blazing. This trophy is for using guns only during the entire mission. But truthfully, I didn't even have to use guns at all, except for shooting these crates that held the ammo boxes inside of them. This should be the trophy, I hope. I, I, didn't, I, didn't use any, I didn't kill anyone. I didn't use, use my weapon other than what I needed to. There we go, Guns Blazing. So... Most of the guides, if not all of the guides, are telling you that you have to use your gun to kill enemies, but just, just don't kill anyone. The final mission of Act 4 is a fight between the governor and Daryl, as Merrill has become the leader of Woodbury. I had no problems winning this fight, even feeding the governor to the zombies, to earn a trophy for not dodging the entire time. Oh, there you go. I got it already. Nice. Only for the governor to somehow still be alive and start in the exact same fight again, which truly made me confused as to what was even happening. I beat the governor two more times before finally executing a special move to finish him off once and for all. Rick Grimes. Bro, she's gonna flip and bomb in now, though.
After this heroic interruption from the group to save Daryl, I got met with this paragraph which I'm more than sure was meant to be placed before this mission even started. Because of this, I lacked the necessary information prior to starting this next mission and spawned in as Rick hitting seven cars in Woodbury without a clear indication as to why. There we go, Woodbury. With Woodbury up in flames, the survivors are welcome to join us in the prison, and we enter Act 5. I assume a few months have passed since Act 4, as we are now facing an entire flu outbreak. The first trophy of Act 5 can be earned pretty much instantly, as we are clearing the outside perimeter of walkers as Daryl. After slowly rounding up 10 walkers, we can eliminate them all within 60 seconds for a trophy. <laughs> This is where the virus really starts to show, as there seems to be a new type of walker within the prison, seemingly infecting the survivors from the inside. Ah! Shit, something's going on. It becomes our job to save the few that remain and eliminate the rest to try and stop this new virus from spreading. This is a relatively simple job, but I did start to get pretty annoyed with the whole headshot only feature this game so gracefully added to the game. Since Daryl took a massive risk clearing out every single person infected with the virus, he too had become sick and Rick decides the best course of action is to get more weapons in case of an outbreak or an attack. We arrive at Rick's hometown, immediately getting shot down from a guy we later figure out is Morgan, the guy from right at the beginning of the game who helped us out for pretty much no reason. There's a trophy to be earned here called Shadow, and to be honest, it is one of the hardest trophies to get in this game. You're required to avoid every sniper shot from Morgan, who conveniently has aimbot and shoots at a constant rate without missing. The laser is auto locked onto you, so the trophy is pretty much only possible by getting the timing down and jumping from cover to cover in order to avoid Morgan's shots. This mixed with the walkers being able to grab you in between cover makes it pretty hard to achieve. However, once I got the timing locked down and managed to set a path out correctly, I did by the skin of my teeth make it to the door oh lovely stuff morgan i need the guns all of them we found a prison the fences can keep them out but but if you got something good that just means there's someone who wants to take it and that is what is happening right just meet me around back at the building and you can take the guns i have to clear man i have to now that the weapons have been secured, we head to an abandoned department store in order to grab some antibiotics. And this is when I started the trophy Thick Skin. This trophy has been bugged for a few months and was one of the main reasons I decided not to attempt this on release, as the PS5 version was unobtainable. Game Mill, being the best in the world, fixed this issue for some odd reason. So now the Platinum is once again obtainable on the PS5 and I was holding out hope that this trophy would not glitch as we were so close to the end of the game. The requirement for the trophy is as followed. One execution elimination, one stab elimination, one stomp elimination, one melee elimination, one firearm elimination, and finally, one grenade elimination. Well, not fucking work, bro. There we go. Lovely stuff. After almost losing the entire run, I decided to slay the remaining walkers with the katana to earn another trophy. There we go. I think you broke up. So with Daryl and Michonne now captured by an unknown group, we play as Beth and manage to grab the trophy for successfully completing five expeditions. Uh, uh. Rick, you there? Come in. I'm here, Beth. He's got Glenn and Michonne. Shit. I've got the medicine. Should I... Get back here now. Before more people die. Before Daryl... But what about... We'll get them both back. I swear it. Over and out. With the group emerging from the prison like the Avengers, it is revealed that Merle is the one behind the kidnappings and he will spare both of them if we give the prison to him. Of course, Rick would never think about saving his group, so he decides to stand his ground and fight instead, resulting in our last choice of the game, ultimately ending Glenn's life instead of giving over the prison. Well, guess I'll see y'all in hell then. No way. No! 
This then starts the final boss battle of the game at a massive disadvantage since we were going up against an entire tank and his men with weapons that do no damage to the body whatsoever. Truthfully, taking out the tank was not the hardest since I could just run around these enemies and focus solely on the tank's health. But the actual fight between Merle and Rick was a different story. Well, I wish it was, but it was simply a reskin of the second phase of the Shane fight from earlier. Merle rolls around the entire fight and lunges attacks at you while walkers spawn in from different locations to add at least some level of difficulty to the battle. After that game ending elimination from Rick, we take over as Michonne as we watch over Daryl and Rick defending the prison from the walkers. Just like that one fight with Andrew, this section has some of the worst visibility I've ever seen. I can only assume they were trying to make it hard so that you can't see exactly who you're shooting, but from what I could tell, Rick and Daryl don't actually take any damage from your shots, so the whole visibility issue is literally there for no reason, other than, I guess, just a bad design choice. After defending Daryl and Rick, the game chucked pretty much every enemy you can think of as a final send-off to the prison, one that can very easily be skipped by rolling past their attacks to finally finish the last act of the game. Keep going. With the story complete, the last thing to do was get five bad expeditions for the trophy Bad Planner. I was always cautious about this trophy alongside the Planner Head Trophy because there's no chapter select and no way to track exactly how many expeditions I had passed or failed. To combat this, I made a separate save just before an expedition, so if I needed to, I could go back to this part of the game and carry on from where I left off. The main reason for doing this, other than to save time, is that there's a very simple way to cheese this trophy by failing the expedition and then quickly restarting the mission over and over again, pretty much guaranteeing me the trophy and, more importantly, finally earning the platinum for the Walking Dead Destinies. And there we go. The Walking Dead Platinum is finally done. Let's flipping go. What a great platinum name as well. The Walking Dead Destinies. I honestly really did not like this game. It was funny. It, it was a funny game. Like the, the cutscenes are stupid. Like the, the gameplay is stupid. The, I don't know. The whole thing is just, it, it's very Kong-esque. Other than it being funny bad, it is just bad. I would not recommend anyone spend any money on any of these game meal games, regardless of what IP they be using. With another amazing platinum added to my collection of bad games, I can safely say only one platinum remains in the Game Mill trilogy. Despite all the negativity surrounding this game, I am fairly certain this was not the developer's fault and not a cash grab like most people are suggesting. We learned very recently with Kong that Game Mill gave the developers a single year to produce the game, and that is why the game was received so poorly. So I would assume that this game was also given the same treatment, and that's why the game feels so unfinished. Either way, this game shouldn't be full price, and to be honest, there's a bunch of other games out there that are completely free with more content to enjoy. So please do not buy this game, even if you are a Walking Dead fan. Again, thank you so much to War Thunder for not only sponsoring the video, but also supporting the channel. Be sure to download War Thunder for free today, and if you're a new player or haven't played in 6 months, be sure to click the link in the description to redeem your massive bonus pack across all platforms, including 100,000 silver lions, multiple vehicles, and these 3 limited decals that are only available until the end of January. Thank you as always for watching this video, I really do appreciate every single one of you, and I will see you all in the next one. Bye bye!